Hey everyone, how's it going? Vivek, do you have this? Are you able to screen share? Did that exactly. you get that to work for you? Just doing that right now, yeah. Okay, perfect. And just so everyone knows, the cases are meant to be interactive. So it's, given that these are smaller groups, if you can turn your camera on so we can have a better kind of small group discussion, I think it'll make it a better session. Sounds good. All right, so uh, I, I guess we'll start with this case. Um, I don't know if one of the residents who's with us would like to, to read it out. Feel free to jump in. Sure, I can go ahead. Please. Hi, I'm Sukmani. Um, so our case is a 63-year-old man with a past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, CAD, and anemia presented to the ED with fevers, dyspnea, and generalized malaise of two weeks duration, has cough with blood tinged sputum. Vitals, um, SATs are 82% on room air, improves to 93% with four liter oxygen nasal cannula, physical exam, he's mildly tachypneic, uh, no accessory muscle use, has bilateral crackles. Okay, so, um, you know, at every phase of the evaluation, we're developing a differential diagnosis, right? So, I guess just with the information we have, what, what are you thinking? So it could be uh, bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonia, uh, lung cancer would be in our differential. Um, the duration is too short for ILD, but some sort of other uh, interstitial process. Yeah, so su super broad at this point. So uh, yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, since you've taken us uh, at the beginning, do you want to talk us through the chest x-ray, Sukhmani? Sure. Uh, it looks like the chest has uh, bilateral diffuse interstitial opacities, worse on the left side and worse um, in the basal segments. So I'm thinking some sort of it could be a viral pneumonia at this point, or, or even like a bacterial pneumonia, bacterial viral. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's a good way of approaching this, and it's a good read. Um, now we have a CT of the same patient. Would someone else like to walk us through some of the key CT scan findings? There's no wrong answers. It's it's all good. We we can go through this together. Totally fine. So I see bilateral kind of ground glass-ish opacities kind of diffusely um, noted sparing the, the periphery, uh, so more centrally focused. Um, and then area of consolidation kind of in the left middle lobe. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So I agree, it's diffuse ground glass, it's bilateral, it seems to involve multi, multiple levels. It's not just at the apex, it's not just further down. Some areas are more consolidated than others. Um, so the lingula is the right middle lobe of the left. So it it's, looks like it's involving the, the lingula very likely in the left upper lobe and perhaps some small bilateral pleural effusions. I, I would agree with your reading. So you are a brand new fellow. You get called with this exact presentation. What's your differential? So Sukhani took us through some of the um, uh, initial thoughts that came to her mind. Does the information we have narrow this down at all? Anyone feel free to jump in. Would uh, would like an ankle vasculitis um, is something that we should consider um, this patient? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know the, the differential definitely includes a, a capillaritis, something that's involving um, diffusely lung parenchyma. The subpleural sparing, you know, can be suggestive of a cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So uh, DAH in the setting of a connective tissue disease, pulmonary edema. Um, and then, you know, infection remains in our differential, but um, the overall uh, picture is looking more like the latter two. So I, I agree that we have to consider a, a, a capillaritis in our differential. So this is our differential. 
what are we going to do about it? What's what's um, what's the next step in evaluation? Are there other questions that you guys would like uh, answered before we proceed? I guess some like basic like serological workup. Um, you're looking for like best writers or just basic labs, I guess. Sure, basic labs, um, uh, vasculitis workup, a BNP, physical exam showing JVD, lower extremity edema, all of that. So let's see what they give us. Oh, patient went downhill really fast before we got all of that. It looks like the patient was intubated and it uh, looks like they're requiring a five of teeth and 50% FiO2 uh, and has a 7.5 ET tube. Your plan is to perform a bronchoscopy. All right. So again, you're the first year fellow. Uh, you've decided with your attending that a bronchoscopy is what's indicated. Um, what are the roles of the different members of the team who are going to be helping you with that procedure? So what's the, what, are the, what are the roles of the physicians? So Dr. Holden went through this a bit in the, uh, in the initial introduction. I guess forgetting out the size. What was that? I'm sorry? Uh, the size of the, the bronchoscope. Yeah, so you're going to pick what kind of bronchoscope you want. You're going to decide the type of anesthesia that you'd like to use for the procedure. You're going to engage with the anesthesiologist about how do we plan for this and how do we help this go safely. Or if you're doing it under conscious sedation or at the bedside in the ICU, deciding uh, the medications that you'd like to use. These are all the kind of physician level decisions that you'd have to make. And perhaps most importantly, discuss it with the patient or their family. In this case, the patient is intubated. So getting accurate uh, and timely informed consent is, is, uh, is key here. Um, the informed consent conversation is a difficult one. I think when people are starting out, we all want to have a very positive view about everything going really well, and that's usually what happens. But, you know, um, for me, uh, I like to uh, use data that we have from the acquire registry, from other sources to try to give some concrete um, ideas about what to expect in terms of risk, okay? Uh, it's tough because you're applying uh, data that comes from very, very large series to individual patients. You obviously have to tailor that. But what are some of the risks that we might want to cover when we're talking about risks of bronchoscopy when you're getting consent? You can just throw some out and I'll give you the numbers that I know and how I try to frame those risks to patients' families. So worsening hypoxia, um, pneumothorax, um, Ahmed said hemoptysis in the chat. Yeah, so it depends also on the maneuvers that you're doing. And that's a dis obviously the first decision that you're making. It's not just a bronchoscopy, it's a bronchoscopy with a BAL, maybe with the lung biopsy, maybe with EBUS, depending on the indication, right? So the risks depend on exactly what you're doing. And that's the first decision you have to make. In this case, we would probably want to do a BAL, possibly a transbronchial lung biopsy. So the risk of bleeding here, we would quote generally is less than 2%. And that again, just comes from the acquire registry, which is an important and now kind of older, but still valuable large body of data looking at risks and outcomes of flexible bronchoscopy. Um, risk of pneumothorax is less than 5% generally. Again, it really depends on your patient. If they have significant bolus emphysema, if they're on really high PEEP, that, that can change. But generally looking at acquire data, it's less than 5% risk of, of pneumothorax of whom a vast minority actually require intervention in the form of a chest tube. Um, just something to bear in mind and that I tell patients when I'm, when I'm quoting the risks. And then I always quote the risk of heart attack, stroke, or death with bronchoscopy and worsening hypoxemia. So the risk, the risk of death with the diagnostic bronchoscopy is 0.02%, one in 5,000, not zero. Again, that comes from about 20,000 patients in the acquire registry. Important to mention because in on the off chance that there's a serious complication, you can't deny that there's a possibility. So I mentioned all of this in a matter of fact way with the numbers, and it really does make people feel more comfortable that you're taking that into consideration. So um, informed consent, done. Um, next, what is the role of the nurse and oftentimes an OR technician uh, who might be with you? So you get into the room, you're getting ready for your case. What are you going to ask for um, your team members to help you with? Patient positioning, timeout. Yeah, absolutely. Medications. Medication. So for every bronchoscopy, um, we have lidocaine, one or 2% available. Uh, we often will have topical epinephrine prepared in advance. These are things that we always prepare and have ready because you never want to be in an emergency needing something. You'd rather have it ready and maybe not need it, but at least you have it ready to go. 
Okay, so the nurse is going to prepare medications. Also, if you're doing the procedure under conscious sedation, they'll be helping you by getting your versed, fentanyl, whatever you've elected to, to administer. And then the role of the RT, it really depends on your institution. There are places where RTs are really playing the role of a, of a bronchoscopy technician. There's places where they're just managing the ventilator. There's places like at my institution at NYU where they really don't have much of a role outside of the ICU and bronchoscopy. So this is really institution dependent. There are also institutions where, um, where almost all bronchoscopies are attended by an anesthesiologist. So, um, you know, just knowing your team members and what they're going to be, um, what their what their roles are at your institution is really important. And then obviously there's a big difference between your routine outpatient bronchoscopy done in a bronch suite or in the OR versus a bedside bronch in the ICU. Oh, I forgot that this came with the answer. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did we get them right? All right, cool. <laughs> Right, more, more or less. Okay, good. good. Uh, oh yeah, and all ICU bronchoscopies, there's almost never a reason not to have your patient pre-oxygenated with 100% FiO2. Uh, and this is just an example of the kinds of things that we tend to have ready for basically every bronchoscopy. Topical epinephrine, every institution is different, but we'll generally do one to 20,000 dilution. So one cc of one to 1,000 uh, epi mixed with 19 saline. But again, uh, your attendings will help guide you on that. Ice saline, ice saline causes vasoconstriction. So for endobronchial bleeding, especially, it can be really helpful uh, for, um, for rapid hemostasis. Um, Similarly with epi, you generally need a lower volume of, of fluid with the epi. Uh, normal saline for your, for your lavage, and then lidocaine. Uh, in this case, they went with 2%. And then the BAL setup, again, differs based on your institution, but they're always ready for that. All right, scope selection, procedure, location. Rather than getting into specifics that we can, um, how are you gonna decide which kind of bronchoscope you need for a given procedure? What are the things that come to mind? Diagnostic therapeutic. Yeah, so the first question is how am I accessing the airway? What do I need to do is the second question. So for a BAL, um, you know, for, for really for any procedure, my bias is I would like the biggest scope that I can have that allows me to ventilate the patient and do the job well. That's generally going to be a scope with a 2.8 channel. Our standard therapeutic bronchoscopes, that's, that's the size um, for Olympus. Uh, the diagnostic scopes generally have a 2.0 channel, uh, and they're, they're great for, um, for you, you can do a BAL through a diagnostic scope. In a patient who's already having hemoptysis, um, you might want to be just prepared with, uh, with uh, therapeutic scope up front. So generally speaking, a 2.8 channel is going to be your go-to. There are um, extra large bronchoscopes. The XT190 bronchoscope has a 3.2 millimeter channel. You'll rarely use that. That's pretty much just for therapeutic bronchoscopy. Uh, and uh, there are also ultra thin, of course, bronchoscopes more for accessing peripheral nodules. So in this case, we're going to pick our bronchoscope on the fact that the patient has a 7.5 ET tube. Uh, and that we're doing probably a BAL in this case. So a 2.0 channel scope is gonna allow us to both ventilate the patient and do what we need to do. Uh, procedure. So we already kind of talked about this. The decision here is, do we need to do a transbronchial lung biopsy or not? A lot of reasons why you might or might not do that, but it's a question that you need to at least to ask as a first year fellow and over time, you know, um, you'll get more comfortable answering it. And there might be differences of opinion in how to approach this to begin with. Uh, and then location. I'm not sure if location here means anatomic location, but let's say it does. How are you going to decide where to do your lavage here? Based on imaging findings. Yeah, for sure. But this is a diffuse process, right? So you're the fellow. Which side are you going to lavage here and why? The right side. All right. Why would you say the right side, turn? Uh, the, the bronchus is more straight down, I guess. Sure, you can aspirate anything into the right lung. That's true. Sorry, you guys can hear my dog running, running around in the background. I apologize for that. Uh, so yeah, you could do the right lung. Uh, there's two ways of looking at this. One is where is the worst anatomic abnormality? So where am I going to get the highest yield sample? In this case, we saw the lingula had a really dense infiltrate. Uh, thinking back. The other way of looking at it is where am I going to cause the least harm? So I generally pick the sicker lung to work in because then no matter what I do, whether it's a lavage, a biopsy, it's being done in the lung that has, uh, we're, we're retaining the lung with more reserve untouched. So in this case, the left lung looked worse and we want a diagnostic sample. So we're probably going to do a BAL in the lingula. Uh, 
Oh, good. I, I, I swear I did not look at this and they agreed with me. So that's, that's cool. Let's, let's keep going. So this is just a, a summary of why we might elect to use a diagnostic bronchoscope in this patient. They made a point of telling us that the patient had a 7.5 ET2. Uh, and given that we're not doing a therapeutic procedure, we're not debulking, we're not removing big clots, we might wanna have a therapeutic bronchoscope available in the event that we encounter something untoward um, because it technically can fit through a 7.5 uh, But for the purposes of just doing a diagnostic lavage, our diagnostic scope is probably adequate. So again, I just wanna reiterate, you always wanna be prepared for everything. You never wanna be in an emergency and asking for something that might take 15, 20 minutes to get. So you'd have your scopes ready, but probably go with the diagnostic scope to start out. So what is bronchoalveolar lavage? This is a way that we try to sample the lung parenchyma uh, while, while we're not in the periphery of the lung. So we're still in relatively central airways, but we're using saline to try to uh, get a sense of any you know, um, abnormal cell counts, any bacteria, viruses. So for one moment. Uh, so, you know, it's useful for our general workup for infection, inflammation, immunologic processes, cell count to differential, something we send with every BAL. Um, the microbiologic studies that you can send are broad. Um, there's the core, you know, AFB, fungal culture, routine culture that we send on pretty much everyone. And then the other tests that you might choose to send are really going to depend on your patient, their immunocompetency, uh, particular exposures that they may or may not have had. Uh, we're sending a lot of COVID PCRs in the current era. Um, so um, many tests that you're going to have to pick from when you're you know, selecting for your patient. And then cytology, um, again, also done on a case-by-case -case basis, useful in an infectious workup when you're thinking about pneumocystis, uh, which with the silver stain would appear positive, and also for our, our uh, evaluation for malignancy. How do you choose your BAL location? So of course, you want something really representative. This is not so much true in fibrotic lung diseases where the areas of fibrosis are often lower yield. Ground glass is generally going to represent an active ongoing process. So we, we target the areas of the densest ground glass. Uh, in this case, it's actually the consolidation in the left upper lobe. The return from a bronchoalveolar lavage. So really all you're doing is wedging your bronchoscope, putting in your saline, and then suctioning or half suctioning or tap tap suctioning. There's many different techniques to try to get the saline back without collapsing the airways, but whatever it is, the yield is always gonna be higher when gravity is helping you, meaning an uh, airway in a segment that's oriented anteriorly. Uh, so the upper lobes, the middle lobe and the lingula, these are the areas that generally have the best return. So here they did it in the left upper lobe for all the reasons described. So what is our actual technique for BAL? Number one is we're going to wedge the bronchoscope in the affected subsegment. Um, you want to make sure that you have a really good view, not so much because there's anything to see during a BAL, but more so because uh, during BAL, if you have a good view, you're going to have really good return. Next, um, you want to make sure that your suction port, which is at three o'clock, is oriented towards the airway, not against the wall, because then both your, um, your installation of saline and your suction are going to be compromised potentially. Uh, you'll see the airway blanch when you put your saline in. That's just because the saline is at room temperature or a little colder than that. Um, the airway collapse that occurs with suctioning is uh, something that we monitor for carefully. It's one of the reasons why we don't necessarily put full blast suction when we're doing the BAL. It's either halfway or very intermittent suction. Uh, and then uh, the wedge, you just want to be sure you're in a good position to retrieve the saline that you've instilled without... Uh, uh, going too far into the airway where, you know, uh, even moderate suction in the, in the more peripheral areas of lung are just going to cause complete collapse of the airway and zero return. Uh, definitely attach a collecting system, otherwise your BAL is just, um, you know, you're not collecting anything. And then we usually do uh, aliquots depending on uh, the patient's reserve. I generally do 40 to 60 cc's. You can do anywhere from 20 to 60 at a time. Um, you really want around 50 to 100 cc's to say that you're representative of what's happening at the level of the alveolus. Uh, I usually send about 40 to 50 cc's and that's, that's fine for most purposes. It really just depends on how many tests you need to send. BAL technique step three, fluid recovery via suction channel. So there's, there's two ways you can do this. Um, you can do suctioning, which is what we do in the majority of cases. Many people and at many institutions using the syringe that you instilled the saline with, you can actually apply negative suction with your hand. 
there's a lot of advantages to this. You have a, a lot more fine control. You're watching the airway. You're making sure your amount of suction that you're applying with your hand is not uh, enough to collapse the airways. Um, sometimes you don't get quite as much back, so we'll do, often do a combination of manual and, uh, and wall suction. Uh, but ultimately, you want to be sure you get at least 30% of what you put in um, to be considered adequate. Also, the more saline that you put in that doesn't get retrieved, the patient has to cough out, and that itself can cause fever. It can be quite inflammatory for patients. So this is an example of using the suction, uh, sorry, the, uh, the biopsy port to perform, uh, to perform BAL. I think this is a video, so I'm just gonna play it now. So this is the blanching of the airway that occurs with BAL. And now they're suctioning back. So in this case, uh, they did serial lavage in the lingula. And serial lavage is something that we do when we have a suspicion for ANCA-associated vasculitis. So if you have a transbronchial lung biopsy and you're bleeding from that um, and you bled, meaning it's not ongoing bleeding, then you would expect that if you put in 20 cc's of saline and take it out and then you do it again and then you do it again, each time it should get less and less bloody because the source of bleeding is not ongoing. With the capillaritis, that's not really the case because you have ongoing injury at the level of the pulmonary capillaries. And so persistent uh, bloody BAL or increased blood in BAL on serial aliquots is considered to be diagnostic of DH. So to summarize, BAL, minimally invasive technique for evaluating what's going on at the level of the alveolus. Uh, there really aren't any absolute contraindications as long as you can do a bronchoscopy. Um, you have to lavage the area that's most likely to have whatever is going on with the diffuse process, then you have to just decide which lung is more affected and maybe go to that side. Uh, and then while the amount of fluid is not standardized, um, serial aliquots are often needed to obtain adequate material. All right, so that was a, a rough summary of BAL. Uh, does someone wanna take on case two? It's okay, I'm not gonna call on anyone. I can read it out, it's okay. So we have a 62 year old lady. She has a history of breast cancer and now she has an enlarging lung mass. So uh, I think without the term systematic portable box approach, this is something that you're all very familiar with uh, from residency that our evaluation is, is gonna take into account their initial exam, initial diagnostic workup. Think about whether a procedure is indicated and if it is, what. Uh, our safety profile for the procedure is, whether it's actually um, the best choice, what the alternatives are gonna be, uh, and obtaining informed consent with all that in mind. Uh, decisions regarding a procedure. So we kind of already covered this, but what's the perioperative care? What's the discussion with the anesthesiologist about the approach to anesthesia? Do we have the necessary equipment? Um, are we ready to deal with complications? And then long-term, uh, what do we do with the results and how does this fit into the patient's uh, natural history of their disease and the evaluation of that disease? So this is the four things that four broad categories of how we approach someone with, uh, in this case, uh, you know, concern for metastatic cancer. So where is the lesion located in this case? Uh, discuss the four box approach. So let's get back. This is the only imaging we've been given. Uh, where 
dissolution. So how would you guys characterize this? It's like a right lower lobe um, consolidation slash mass. Yeah, I think that's perfect. It looks like it's probably in the superior segment of the right lower lobe. Uh, it does look consolidative, um, kind of linear. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. So patient evaluation, what are the risks and benefits of the procedure? Um, so we kind of already covered this when we're talking about BAL. I, I use a similar spiel with everyone. The real reason for that is you don't know what you're gonna do 100% until you're in the airway. I can't tell you how many times I've been surprised by an endobronchial lesion when I was only planning to perhaps do an EBUS. And you know, you never want to feel that you haven't, number one, given the patient the chance to give informed consent before, uh, and number two, that you're not ready to deal with an unexpected finding. So when I get consent for a bronchoscopy, I generally get consent for anything I might conceivably encounter. Um, I mean, I, I'm not getting consent for a stent in a case that clearly will never need a stent, but you know, endobronchial lesions are surprisingly common. So in this case, I would definitely, especially with cancer in mind, go into this with the idea that I may end up having a stage by EBUS. I may have to do an endobronchial biopsy. I mean, I want all the options available to me so the patient doesn't have to have another procedure on another date. So that's the only caveat I'll give to the risks and benefits conversation we had a couple minutes ago. So what sampling technique would you choose? Washing, needle, forceps biopsy, uh, brushing? What are the expected outcomes and follow-up? I don't know if these are rhetorical questions or if we're meant to answer them. Oh, I think we're meant to answer them, sorry, <laughs> okay. Um, the broad answer here is I would do everything. Uh, and we do everything because we have good data to support the fact that specifically for lung nodules that um, our diagnostic yield is absolutely highest when multiple biopsy and sampling techniques are taken into account. So for basically everything, we'll do a needle biopsy followed by a forceps biopsy if there's not too much bleeding, BAL very often, and then almost always a brushing. So the overall yield is going to be highest if you have multiple modalities, because you never know which one is actually going to catch the diagnostic material. Um, is there any time when you would just do needle versus forceps? That's a great question. The only reason I would almost ever do only needle and not forceps is if there's a lot of bleeding. I always do my needle first because a 21 gauge needle is far less likely to cause bleeding uh, when you're biopsying a lung nodule than forceps. Um, number two, if anatomically, I can't use forceps. So when we're doing robotic bronchoscopy, we're often accessing relatively central lesions where there may or may not be an airway sign or a bronchus sign. Meaning um, if you have an airway leading you directly to an nodule, great. Then my tools that are coming out of the bronchoscope straight ahead of me are almost certainly going to be able to access it if I can get the bronch in the right position, right? But when we're sampling something that is in a more central airway where um, I don't have an airway going into it. Well, forceps aren't really going to penetrate that wall without leaving a fairly large hole. A needle almost certainly can, though, especially if it's guided by, you know, either the use of EBUS or uh, a robot with um, some kind of imaging finding. We use a lot of uh, cone beam CT type imaging to, to guide us, but every institution is a bit different. My point being, sticking forceps through a really central airway wall is not a great option, but you can use a needle. So either because of bleeding or anatomy of the location, I might only do a needle biopsy and not forceps. Rarely I've done forceps and not needle, um, only really when I'm specifically getting more tissue for a study in a site that's already biopsy proven malignancy, I might not waste time with the needle. I might just go for it with forceps specifically for a larger lesion. And then never forget the brush. I have many times gotten a diagnosis only on brush cytology and not any of the others. There's a lot of reasons why that can happen, uh, but always do a brush. So preventing bleeding during and after transbronchial lung biopsy. This is probably one of the most important things um, that you can be prepared for. Um, when you're a practicing pulmonologist, transbronchial lung biopsy is often thought of as a bread and butter procedure, but in many ways, it's one of the highest risk procedures that we do. Um, because though we're using fluoroscopy very often to guide these biopsies, a transbronchial lung biopsy is basically you're wedging your bronchoscope and instead of doing a BAL, you're putting forceps out to what you think is the periphery of the lung. You don't really know how far you are from the pleura and uh, you're taking some bites and <laughs> hoping for the best. Obviously, I'm being facile, you're guiding it in many ways and uh, there's techniques we use to be in the right spot, but um, bleeding is going to happen if you do transbronchial lung biopsy and you just wanna be prepared. So number one, when we're doing transbronchial lung biopsies, if your patient is prone to bleeding, do your best to correct that. Are they uremic? You can give DDAVP. 
Are they thrombocytopenic? You can give them platelets and, and hopefully they're functional platelets. If they're on anticoagulation, you can wait for that to wear off if, if feasible. Um, maintain wedge position after biopsy. If you're in wedge, the key with bleeding during biopsy is control. If I'm bleeding from my right middle lobe, as long as it's only my right middle lobe medial segment that's bleeding and the blood isn't going anywhere else, well, then I have a whole lot of other lung ventilating. If that blood starts going into the other segments, your central airway dead space is only around 150 milliliters. That's not a lot. And your patient's not really coughing while they're under anesthesia, right? So it doesn't take a lot of blood for your central airways to get full of blood and suddenly you're not ventilating. So maintaining wedge position is absolutely critical to uh, preventing bleeding from transbronchial biopsy from being a, a major issue. Avoid a ton of suction during biopsy. I find that suction after bleeding during transbronchial biopsy just makes things a lot messier. Obviously, you're going to suction a bit just to see how much blood there is. But um, holding down suction just whips the blood around and makes it a lot harder to know what's going on. Uh, there's different ways you can approach bleeding in the therapeutic, um, with the therapeutic or temporizing uh, approach in mind. So one option is ice saline. Ice saline can be really helpful for two reasons. Number one, as I mentioned earlier, ice saline is going to vasoconstrict. So if you have a bleeding pulmonary artery, it can, it can help to control bleeding until um, hemostasis um, is achieved. Number two, uh, filling the distal airway with, with the saline is tamponading. So uh, both as a tamponade effect and also from the, the temperature can be really helpful to put ice saline in. Uh, the counterpoint of that is that um, ice saline will make a little bit of blood look like a lot. So just be prepared for that. Um, and then topical epinephrine, I don't find useful for this. Um, it's really only useful for uh, endobronchial bleeding that you can see because the epi is not gonna make it to your, your pulmonary artery that's hopefully the pulmonary artery that's, uh, that's bleeding. So ice saline, the use of a Fogarty balloon uh, can be helpful. Uh, balloon tamponade is something that we discuss in this slide, I think. So um, what are the simple things that you can do if there's bleeding during the biopsy? First of all, turn your patient. It's the easiest thing. Again, the whole point is you want a as much healthy ventilating lung as possible. So part of that, number one is wedge. Number two is turn the patient. Now you have a whole other lung that's not uh, in a dependent position and that hopefully won't, uh, you know, will, will continue to ventilate. So bleeding side goes down every time. Number two, uh, if you lost wedge in the process of turning, get wedge. Number three, consider cold saline to help with making a clot. And then finally, uh, an endobronchial blocker is an invaluable tool uh, to isolate lung. Um, it's kind of an advanced technique. I don't think a first or second year fellow would really get to do more than maybe one or two. Um, so any opportunity you have to place a blocker, even if it's a preemptive blocker, take it because you'd rather do that in a controlled setting than in an emergency when you're in attending. An endobronchial blocker basically goes through an endotracheal tube uh, or a trach, uh, but more often an endotracheal tube. And you inflate a balloon. This is sitting in a particular uh, adapter that allows it to be secured in position. So let's say I do a right middle of transbronchial biopsy. I could just left main stem my ET tube and do one lung ventilation, but I'm really, I'm losing a whole lung. The whole right lung is gonna fill with blood in that circumstance very likely, right? If I put an endobronchial blocker with this balloon tip sitting in the right middle lobe, well, now I have uh, every other lobe working while I give time for the blood to clot, maybe have a chance to talk to IR surgery if it's really that bad, it usually isn't. Short of an endobronchial blocker, which is not the easiest thing to place, um, you can use a Fogarty balloon. A Fogarty balloon is an endovascular balloon. It's used for um, thrombectomy, but you can put it through the working channel of a 2O or a 2A channel bronchoscope. And while your bronchoscope is in the airway, you can have a Fogarty balloon in place so you can have hemostasis uh, and monitor for spillage of the lung segment. So balloon tamponade is a, is a valuable skill to learn. Um, and you probably want to learn it before it's an emergency. If your program um, doesn't have a lot of opportunities for it, you can always do it in a simulation setting, but I think it's a really, really important thing to know how to do. So diagnostic yield for transbronchial lung biopsy, it really depends on whether you're talking about a diffuse parenchymal lung disease or something that's more focal. Uh, and there's so many caveats because we do transbronchial lung biopsy via electromagnetic navigation, via just a regular bronchoscope, via um, robotic bronch with cone beam. So it really depends on what you're doing. Um, the very broad yields that are given here has to be taken with like huge grains of salt. So for primary tumor overall, the yield is greater than 60%. For metastatic disease, the yield is over 50%. The addition of brushing always increases your yield. I, I think it's always helpful. Um, Maybe negative, but occasionally, like I said, it'll be the only thing that's positive. 
Uh, and then benign nodules can have a slightly lower yield, but again, it depends on how you're approaching them. Peripheral lesions, um, there's a couple of factors that are important to bear in mind on the diagnostic yield for peripheral lesions, peripheral lung nodules or masses. Um, the size is number one. So if the yield is great, if the size is greater than two centimeters, um, your yield is definitely going to be better. Uh, the presence or absence of a bronchus sign. So if you have an airway going directly into your lesion, your diagnostic yield is going to be substantially higher. The use of radial ultrasound, uh, particularly radial ultrasound where you have a concentric view, the diagnostic yield is over 80%. Um, the use of a guided imaging guided bronchoscopy is, is usually going to be helpful. Um, there's a lot of variability. It really depends. Um, some of the studies that have been done on yield of robotic bronch have been done in patients who have a broad range of, of tumors from one to five centimeters. Some have been done in the sub two centimeter range. So the yield has to be taken into account um, as to the study population. Uh, but it depends on local expertise and what you're going after, really. Uh, but basically, if you have a bronchus going to the lesion, you can anticipate a very, very high diagnostic yield. For diffuse disease, actually our yield is often better, particularly for diseases like sarcoid, alveolar proteinosis, or lymphangitic carcinomatosis, things that are running along the bronchovascular bundle and that are diffuse. You kind of don't have to be too targeted to get an accurate diagnosis. Um, can be helpful for pneumoconiosis as well, pneumocystis, and then uh, transplant rejection. These are all really helpful. Uh, for a diffuse malignancy presenting like in a mnemonic pattern, like um, a um, a mucinous adenocarcinoma, for example, uh, you can, even the setting malignancy that's more diffuse, have a good, good yield for transbronchial lung biopsy. And then HP has a, has a great diagnostic yield overall. Fluoroscopy is useful, kind of. I mean, you got to take this with a grain of salt. You're looking at a 3D structure in two dimensions. It can be helpful. It can be misleading. And so while we do use fluoroscopy almost always when we do transbronchial lung biopsies, it's really just to have a rough idea that we're in the right place and that we're getting near to the periphery of the lung and that we're not causing a pneumothorax. But um, we can't say that fluoroscopy is gonna correlate 100% with what we're intending to do. You just have to really be careful when interpreting the findings on fluoro. Fluoro is really also very helpful when we're using multiple tools through guide sheets to know where things are. So if you're using a guide sheet with radial EBUS to guide your biopsies, for example, fluoro is great just to know when you're out of the guide sheet, for example. So. Um, Fluoro is very helpful, but you have to take into account um, what, it's, um, what it's actually telling you and what you think it's telling you. So I think this is describing overall complication rates of transbronchial lung biopsy uh, with a pneumothorax rate of around 4%, bleeding of around 2%, and death in 0.1%. And this was a, a retrospective review of this is a review of 22 prospective studies uh, done from the 70s to the 90s. The acquire registry is a little bit um, more updated and it shows comparable findings, a lower risk of death in the acquire registry, but comparable bleeding and pneumothorax rates. The summary of transbronchial lung biopsy, useful for diffuse and localized lung infiltrates. Uh, for focal abnormality, if you have a greater than two centimeter nodule and a nodule is anything three centimeters or less, uh, or I should say under three centimeters, sorry. Um, the presence of an airway sign. So both of these are um, indicative of more likely uh, successful transbronchial biopsy. And then just be prepared for the risk of pneumothorax and bleeding. I've been going on for a bit. If there's any questions, uh, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, there's only a few minutes left. So the last bit of these cases is just fun pictures. So it, uh, good time to ask questions or we can show you some fun pictures about uh, different airway anomalies. I guess my, my, my final like, kind of summary of BAL, TVBX, whatever you're doing is be prepared. You want to be sure that you have uh, everything you might possibly need done in advance, whether it's, you know, your procedural planning, your discussion with the anesthesiologist, the informed consent should really cover anything you might want to do, and then have the equipment you need in the room to deal with complications, ice saline, epinephrine, fogarty balloons, chest tube kits. If you have it, um, then suddenly what might otherwise be a really dramatic emergency just becomes a, a complication and you're ready to deal with it. All right, if there's no questions, name the anom uh, anomaly. Please jump in. This is the trachea. Let's start there. This is the cartilage. This is the posterior membrane. The right and the left remember, Yeah, I was going to say, do you guys remember the initial picture? Christina, you may have an idea there, I see. Radial stenosis? 
So uh, this is a specific uh, pattern um, called a saber sheath trachea. So this is seen most commonly in people with significant smoke exposure, um, people who are older. It, it is somewhere in the realm of TBM and stenosis because it really has features of both. The posterior membrane is not really moving normally in the setting for the most part. Uh, and uh, really, really common, more often a radiographic finding that's incidentally noted on, on imaging or, or bronchoscopy. Uh, but yeah, it's the saber sheath trachea. Okay, what do we have here? Just describe what you see. You don't have to know the name, but what it, what looks different? The vessels are looking a little bit more prominent and there's some pigmentation. <laughs> yeah, so this is SBC syndrome trachea. So that's a, that's a good catch that in the setting of SBC syndrome, you do have neovascularization. You do have hypertrophy of vessels feeding the trachea, basically going back um, uh, throughout the chest. You'll often see uh, um, pretty diffuse neovascularity. So that was a really good catch. You can just describe this, guys. So again, we're in the trachea. This is not normal. Looks kind of polypoid. This is a tracheal polyp. A lot of possibilities for what this could actually represent, but um, these are great to snare. They have a relatively narrow base and they're a lot of fun to snare. What are we looking at here? Now we're no longer in the trachea, we're in the more distal airways. These you see more commonly than the other three things we've shown you thus far. Seem like mucosal ulcerations. Yeah, so they're often called mucus pits. Sometimes they're called diverticula. They're not like GI diverticula that are prone to bleeding. They're just mucus pits. They're benign findings. Don't biopsy them. <laughs> How would you characterize this? Is this like an endobronchial mass with, um, is there some sort of a tracer? I don't know, like a mark. Uh, I think it's just a uh, glare. It's a really uh, juicy uh, endobronchial lesion. Um, I wouldn't call it a mass. If it's not three centimeters or larger, it wouldn't qualify, but it's an endobronchial lesion. It's smooth, it's at a carina. It's really nonspecific. I don't think you can say really just based on looking at it, but based on the location, carcinoid has to be in a differential. Uh, endobronchial carcinoids do like to live at carinas. They tend to be in the central airways. They're not absolutely not necessarily, but we often see them in the central airways. Uh, and we usually perform endobronchial management really only for cases that are not uh, candidates for, for surgical resection. What do we got here? This one we had already quoted earlier, I think. Yeah, you guys guessed this one earlier. This looks like it's in the subglottic space, uh, pretty high in the trachea. So this is a subglottic stenosis. I know that it's subglottic because here we no longer see cartilage around us, right? So we're at the level of the, uh, the cricoid most likely, and we're not seeing the cartilage that we should see from the first tracheal ring. So it looks like a web overlying that. So this is a subglottic stenosis. These are often idiopathic. There, there are some triggers for them like reflux, obesity, smoking. What do we got here? And we got one minute. So this is the last one. It's my favorite. Tracheal papillomatosis, wear your N95. <laughs> you definitely don't want to be uh, cauterizing or, or doing things with these with, uh, without appropriate PPE. Um, so these are often uh, uh, HPV related, they're not necessarily, and uh, tracheal papillomatosis is um, interesting finding. All right, thanks so much, guys. I think we're going to close the breakout room. Yeah. Thank you all for attending. See you all hopefully at ATS.